All right. Um, we are uh, moving on um, into another topic tonight as we continue our study, our topical study uh, from the Psalms. And uh, tonight we're going to consider what we can learn from uh, a few psalms. We'll keep with our same pattern and take a look at three psalms and some things we can learn, this time on the subject of worship. Um, and so there really probably is no more fitting topic to try to pull out of the psalms than the idea of worship and what we can, um, we can learn about worship. We all know what the psalms are, right? They are songs. They were written for the purpose of worship. And so this sort of creates a circle here because not only were they for the purpose of worship, but they can also teach us a lot of things about how to worship. Um, and so uh, we're going to, to use these for that purpose. If you go to the very beginning of the psalms, uh, it describes the kind of worshipers that God wants us to be. If you want to flip over uh, to Psalm 1, um, that's not the psalm that we're going to, uh, to focus on first tonight, but, but we are going to focus on this passage because it, it drives this point home. It's a very familiar passage that says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, uh, I sort of underlined as I was looking at that passage, verse 2, uh, when we're thinking about the idea of worship. Because what does it mean? What does it mean when we say worship God? Now, there's a sense where it has to do with us gathering together and participating in a corporate worship service. And we're going to talk a lot ab about that. Um, but when, when you just think about what does it mean to worship something. When you say, I worship the ground he walks on, right? What, is, what does that word worship mean? It means we adore that person. It means that they're exalted in our sight. And so when we're saying these things, when we're saying that we worship God, uh, it sometimes we think about the approach that we take here together as a group to worship him but to be worshipers of God carries with it that, the idea of what that word means. That is, we love him, we adore him, we exalt him. He's the one above us all. He's the one that all of our praise and all of our glory is due to. And that's sort of what verse 2 is saying to us. Um, we delight in his law. We don't often think about delighting in law, do we? I didn't put this in my notes, and I'm really not proud to talk about it, but recently I was uh, uh, driving Jonathan to Jacksonville State University, and I went up Highway 77, and I made a turn, and when I made a turn, there was a truck that had been holding me up, and I felt liberated when I made that right turn, and I took off, and about a quarter mile away, I saw some lights, and they were flashing on me, and um, and so uh, he asked me where I was going, and I, I thought, is there an answer to this that would get me off? I mean, I was going to tell him the truth, but I thought, you know, and so I, I have a friend who is a, um, has, has a, had a career as a trooper, and, and he still works in that kind of line of duty, and I said, was there an answer that I could have given him that would have... Uh, Got me. He said, no, they just want you to start telling on yourself. And so, um, so you don't have to pay anything extra for that, but uh, don't think that there's an answer that's going to get you out of the ticket that I just got through paying, which was a very painful process. And I'll tell you later more about that after this class is over. Um, but where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> we don't typically think about law as being something we delight in, do we? I mean, law is something that we, we follow, we deal with. I mean, we, we're, you know, but delight in law, but when it's God's law and when it's the things that God wants us to do, 
if we're really worshipers of him, we love his law. That's what this verse says, right? And so, you know, I wasn't so delighted about the fact that that was a 45 mile an hour zone and I was going 60 something miles an hour. <laughs> but we delight in God's, in God's law if, and, and we meditate on it. These are signs that we are worshipers of God. Those two verses there, here they are from another translation. I think it helps us a little bit with our understanding of this passage. It says this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in doing everything the Lord wants. Day and night, they think about his law. That's worshipers. Worshipers delight in doing what the Lord wants us to do. Now, there's where that delight in law comes. We do it because God wants us to do it, and we're worshipers of him. So, when we think about being worshipers of God. What do we spend our time on? Who do we hang around with? Who's the focus of our life? Those questions help us to determine what it is that we worship. And so I want us to consider tonight how we can be better worshipers of God. And some of that has to do with when we gather together to offer our worship to God, we need to think about this every single Sunday. And like a lot of things that happen with that kind of frequency, sometimes we don't always bring our A game, right? Sometimes there are the distractions of life. Sometimes we just, we get into a rut personally. But every time we come together to offer our worship to God, we need to think about things like the fact that we delight in following him and all the blessings that he gives him. And we're going to talk about a lot of the things that we really can put in our mind to help us get in that, that frame that we need to be in to offer praise to him. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than when, when there's a group of people who are truly dedicated to worship gathering together whether that be in our focus on what's being said from God's word, whether that's in the way that we sing together with all of our heart. Um, we need to, to, to think about when we gather together for worship, putting everything that we have into it because of the one we worship. Um, you know, worship, although... The, the way that we're sitting this evening um, is the way that we sit for, for our worship service, right? And so it often brings with it the idea that whoever up here is the one who's leading the worship and, and then there are the spectators, right? Uh, you know, in, a, in an arrangement like this, it might lead us to believe, right? If we had a speaker up here, everybody would just be listening to the speaker. You know, if we had a singer up here for a concert, there would be the audience. And so it lends itself to thinking of it that way. But that's not what worship is, right? Who is the audience for worship? God, right? So no matter how we orient this room, there is an audience of one for our worship, and that's God, and then everyone else are participants. And we all, it, it helps us sometimes to just think about it that way for a minute. Because sometimes my, the way that I'm participating in a particular worship service may look somewhat passive, but a lot of times it has to do with what's going on in my mind and in my heart, right? And, and, so, and they're, they're, you know, we're all singing together. And so, you know, that's why it's so important for all of us to sing. God doesn't care what it sounds like, right? He can, uh, he can turn that auto-tune on his way and it all sounds beautiful to him no matter what we sound like. We need to be singing praises with all of our heart. We need to be engaged in prayers that are being offered. You know, we, we've talked, uh, you know, even in the last few weeks, right? Uh, it, well, really each Sunday we talk about what the, you know, what the communion means and uh, and how important it is and how we need to focus and partake of it in the right kind of way with the right mindset. And, and just like all the rest of worship, it doesn't need to be something that becomes old hat. 
because it's new and it's beautiful each time that we gather together. All right, let's, uh, let's get into a psalm that can help us with some of this and some of the thoughts that we need to have about, uh, about our worship. And we're going to begin with Psalm 66. So if you'll flip over to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. Our first point tonight is that we can worship God for the many blessings He gives. We can worship God for the many blessings He gives. So one of the things, one of the reasons that we worship God, it may sound a little bit selfish, right? But it's for all the blessings that He gives us, right? And, and so we want to return that worship for all that God does for us. Let's read this psalm together. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through, river on, through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip? For you, O God, have tested us. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you've brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble, I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear, all you who fear God. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he's not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. And I will tell what he has done for my soul. So the writer of this psalm worships God by praising him for various things. And like the psalmist does... We can praise God for, for both the, what I would call the internal things, the way that he works in our life, and the external things, the way that God demonstrates his nature and his character to us. Maybe here's a good way for us to, to uh, look at this psalm. It's pretty lengthy, and so to, to try to mine some things out of it, um, let's consider some of the different actions that we're to take in worshiping God. So let's go back through Psalm 66 and we're going to pick out some action words that we can associate with worship. So go back to the very beginning. In verse 1, shout for joy to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name. Shout for joy. So when we're singing, if you've ever been punished by having to sit in front of me, I, I tell people I learned one way to sing, and that was out. You know, to sing out, right? You know, and, and so, um, but you know that that's that's all I know to do, right? And so, um, as a song leader, and I know there's several song leaders here. Sometimes when we look out and we see somebody and they look sad and their mouth's not moving. Well, for one thing, it sort of makes me sad to see that, um, but it makes me sad because of what it means to shout for joy to God. There's just something that it does to your soul to just turn loose of song. Now, and and maybe, maybe you don't necessarily love music as much as I do and, and to sing as much as I do, but there's just something that it does I mean, even if you're just in the shower, right? It makes you feel better to just sing out, you know. And so, Jimmy. Last year, the kindergarten class at BBS, how they sang, that singing out. 
That's right. And it's, and it's out, right? I mean, it's, it's with, the whole, with the whole heart, right? And so, um, you know, when I see this shout for joy to God, I don't think about someone screaming, but I think about singing out and just turning it loose. You know, I don't know, I don't know how else to say it, but just with all of our heart, praising God. All right, verse 2. Uh, there, again, we're looking for action words here, right? So shout was there in verse 1. In verse 2, sing, sing the glory of his name, give to him glorious praise. You know, our worship is a gift to God. And, you know, we need to think about it that way, right? Is we're presenting a gift to God. And so that all needs to go into, you know, we have specific responsibilities in worship. You know, we want our gift to be the best that it can be. For all of us that are participating together in worship, you know, we want, we want to do the best we can. We, nobody likes to give terrible gifts, right? We want to give the best gift to God to show the appreciation that we have for the blessings that he gives us. Verse 3, say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So you could, you know, if you're, you want to underline these action words, there's shout and sing and give and say there in verse 3. In verse 4, all the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. So there again, we are actively worshiping God and singing praises to him. We can skip down a couple of verses. You may find some more than I did, but you go down to verse 7. And um, did I mark that one right? I found rejoice here, and I said it was in verse 7. Verse 6, there we go. Thank you. So he turned the sea into dry land. They passed through on foot. There did we rejoice in him, right? So again, that idea of joy and, and, and that we rejoice in the one we follow. Drop on down to verse 13, um, and you see... Um, I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. Um, you know, our, our worship doesn't have sacrifices in it anymore, but it really is our offering to God. And so, uh, again, just another way to think about what we're doing when we're worshiping. It, it is our offering that we're bringing before God. Verse 14. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. So there we're, we're uttering, we're promising. Uh, verse 16, come and hear all you, fear, all you who fear God. I cried to him with my mouth and high praise was on my tongue. So, you know, marked there crying and, and praise, high praise. So there's a lot of words there and, and it's... If you think about all those words, if you listed them or you marked them, you can get an idea of the picture that it draws of the kind of attitude and feeling of heart and mind that we should have when we approach God. Verse 18 says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. That's an important thing. I think I may have lost my signal there. Um, am I good? Okay, thanks. Um, so th there's an important point here about worship that sort of steps aside from all those words that create that picture for us. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. We talked a lot last week about the importance of confession and the importance of um, you know, asking for forgiveness for our sins and removing those things that separate us from God. How did Isaiah 59 two put it? But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Here we're talking about hindrances from worship. Those things, those, those actions we may be taking 
the condition of our heart, if it's not in alignment with God, we need to take care of those things or we're just, we're really fighting a battle that, that you know, cannot be accomplished um, with sin between us and God when we're trying to worship him. Um, and, and so that again, just like we talked about last week, is the, such, so much importance there on that, on confession. If you're in this class on Sunday morning, we talked about 1 John 1 on Sunday, and Jason you know, took us through that, that idea of that continual cleansing that occurs. And, but part of that is that we continue to confess those things, that we hate sin one another, for one thing, we don't give ourselves over to that sin, but that we confess those sins, and God's faithful to continue to forgive us of those sins. And so an important aspect of our, of our worship is to get rid of those things that are separating us from God. Separation doesn't create a situation for worship. So go back to the, the first couple of verses there, um, verses 1 and 2. Shout for joy uh, to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. So we talked about how those, you know, can be in our corporate worship, can be um, followed. But don't you think those things can also be followed in our everyday life? Um, our actions as we go out to live in this world, there can be an awful lot of shouting for joy um, about our God that we follow and the blessings that he gives us. Uh, that needs to be what we do every day, right? As we live for him, as we show an example as the light of the world and we explain why we are what we are to the world. Um, this is an excerpt from a book entitled The House of Worship. And it had a really interesting point here that I had never quite thought about it this way. It says this, the, so, so this is talking about the one we worship. The quickest way to find yourself, I'll tell you before I start reading this any further, is bear with me for a second because this it sounds sort of weird when you say it, but just give me a second to get the thought out. The quickest way to find yourself is to lose yourself in God. That sounds a little flighty, right? Just a little bit. But think about it this way. John the Baptist said that Jesus had to become greater while he, John, had to become less. That's a great motto for being worshipers of God, the worshiping life. So here, here's the situation. As Jesus becomes greater in our lives and we become less, we become less in, a, in such a way that we become greater, right? So think about that one more time, right? Because I'm saying a lot of things that are sort of a paradox, right? As Jesus becomes greater in our lives and we become less, just like John the Baptist said, I've got to get out of the way and Jesus has to move forward. Well, in our lives... The less it's about us and the more it's about Jesus, what happens? The better off we are. The greater we are overall when we start making our lives a lot less about us and a lot more about the one that we worship, about Jesus and about God. So that's how we really become the true self that God wants us to be is just like John the Baptist in a different way John was saying, I've got to step out of the limelight and Jesus is going to move on now. But if we think about it within our own lives, sometimes we need to, not sometimes, we need to step out of the way and let Jesus take over and be the leader of our lives. That's what being a worshiper of God is all about. All right, Psalm 34 is where we're headed next. Psalm 34.
Our next point is we can praise God in spite of difficult circumstances. We can praise God in spite of difficult circumstances. Let's read Psalm 34 together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, to those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So if you have a caption above Psalm 34, can somebody just tell me, you know, the, the, you know it sort of says to the whatever and, and gives you the, the setting for the psalm. Can somebody read me what your, what your uh, translation has there? Okay, all right. So that that that's it. Um, it had to do with um, Abimelech, and this is the assumed um, context of this psalm. It's not like uh, in what I read. It's not a hundred percent sure, but I don't think we do any damage to set it right here. Um, and, and having to do with Abimelech, that means that if you go to First uh, Samuel twenty-one. 1 Samuel 21, um, this is the backdrop for this psalm. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and read it, make a comment or two here, and then we'll get back to this psalm. So if you go, go to 1 Samuel 21 to see what David is, is dealing with, uh, but when he writes this psalm about being in difficult circumstances, it says this, starting in verse 10. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see this man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I like madmen that you've brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And so uh, you basically see David in a, a difficult situation that he's trying to get out of, right? When that begins, he's fleeing from Saul, and then he sort of flees into another situation you know, that, that presents a difficulty. Here he is uh, in, in front of Achish, and so uh, he pretends to be insane, and all of that allows him to be delivered. Now, you might say, um, you know, that heading that we read in Psalm 34 said Abimelech, and so let's just deal with that right quick, and you don't have to pay anything extra for this, right? So, um, at least uh, a couple things that I read said that 
this may be a situation like, um, what's the name of one of the pharaohs? Ramses, is that right? Is he, was he, he was one of the pharaohs, right? So you think about like Pharaoh and Ramses, and that Abimelech may have actually been a title like Pharaoh, and Achish would have, may have been the name like Ramses. And so if this is the setting of that situation, that's how you align what, it, what was said about in Psalm 34, that this was about Abimelech with the fact that we're talking about Achish here. Now, if this, does not, if this is not the real match, this psalm may have been written just to um, talk about a number of situations where David was protected throughout his life. So it could go either way there. It probably fits here, and that explanation is pretty good about Abimelech and Achish very possibly being the same person. So, um, but we know that the Lord protected David in a number of ways throughout his life. And um, in, in this psalm, um, David credits God for all the safety that he provided him. And so um, when you think about praising God or worshiping God, during difficult circumstances, one of the things that came to my mind is um, this is a good thing to talk about with a Wednesday night crowd, right? Wednesday night is often a time that we come to church and we're worn slap out, right? It's the middle of the week. We're sort of pooped. We finally made it to the, you know, to hump day. Um, but, you know, maybe we've worked all day, we're running in here, you know, we're still thinking about what the rest of the week has to hold, and how many times, you know, do we come in here, we go through, you know, we have Bible study and sing together, and undoubtedly we say, I feel better now, right? I mean, it, it just feels better to be with your brethren and to worship God together. And so, uh, when, when, you know, those aren't the, necessarily the most difficult of situations when we're just tired, but it's one of those. And when we think about what worship can do for us, think about how many times in your life your heart was heavy and it was hurting and, and you had a time of worship with your brothers and sisters and it makes things better. And that's what this psalm is really all about. So... Um, we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to try to do this exercise, and hopefully I can do it some justice, and we'll finish with this second point tonight. So this is a little bit similar to what we did with that first psalm in, in a way to try to go back and sort of um, make some points about it that will stick with you. Let's go back and look at, again, what are the things of action in this psalm that indicate ways that we're to praise and worship God. And then I want you to think about, in some of these cases, the psalm itself says, um, what's the benefit that you're going to reap from this action that you're taking? So let's do this. Go back to verse 1 here in Psalm 34. And uh, in verse 1, first action there that I see is to bless the Lord. And it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. What's our benefit from that? I'll always want to speak his name and praise him. The name of the Lord needs to be on our tongue an awful lot, right? It doesn't need to be something that we just talk about when we're here and then we go out and live the rest of our life, right? The name of the Lord needs to be on our tongue a lot. We need to bless the Lord at all times. We need to always be ready to give an answer about our faith, but just to talk about what God has done for us. Verse 2. Verse 2, I, I, I marked it here, boast in the Lord. Um, boast in the Lord. And that's, that's interesting wording, right? We're, we're never told very often to boast about things, right? Uh, when it comes to ourselves, we shouldn't be boasting about things. But we do need to boast in the Lord. And, you know, no matter what test we go through or trial, we can rejoice in who we follow and who our God is. And we need, to, we need to have that attitude of boasting in the Lord. That's a good way to think about it is we've got God on our side. You know, 
What's the verse? What can man do to me? God is on my side. What can man do to me? We need to boast in the Lord. That's what verse 2 talks about um, in terms of worshiping Him. Verse 3 says, magnify the Lord. You know, if there's one thing that we can't do, we can't make God any greater than He already is. But in a sense, we can magnify the Lord when we share Him with others. And so we can magnify it in the sight of it. I mean, we can't make God any greater or bigger um, than, he, than He is, but we can magnify Him in the lives of others. Uh, verse 4, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. So what does verse 4 say that we'll, we can do if we seek the Lord? He'll answer us and He'll deliver us from our fears. That particular one tells us exactly what God will do if we seek the Lord. Verse 5, look to the Lord. It says, look to the Lord, and it tells us again in this verse what will happen. Those who look to the Lord will be radiant, and our faces will never be ashamed. I'm guessing we probably all think pretty much about the same picture when we see something about faces being radiant, right? Think about Moses on Mount Sinai being in the presence of God. He comes down from the mountain. They can't look at him. His face is, is so bright, right? So this verse is talking about what happens when we're in the presence of God. And think about that. You know, it tells us that our faces are going to be radiant. It, they won't be glowing like Moses, but there'll be something different about the way we are, our presence before others, and so when we look to the Lord, we're going to be radiant and our faces will never be ashamed of the one that we're following. Okay, we're going to have to put a peg right there and start there next week. Um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of wrap up on Psalm 34. If you want to read the next one that we're going to talk about, it'll be Psalm 103 next week. Thanks.